Living Mosaic is a project of the Spark of Humanity Network, and you've tuned into our bi-weekly broadcast. Um, if you were hoping to find uh, the face of our fearless leader, Martha Holden, I have terrible news for you. You have instead found the face and voice of a fearful follower, Danielle, who um, I am an old friend of Martha's, and when she asked me to attend to this uh, session this week, I accepted the invitation. Um, Martha, by the way, has COVID, which is uh, something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I am certainly praying for a speedy recovery for her and for her speedy return for the next broadcast of Living Mosaic. I uh, will do a little bit more referring to notes than she typically does, and I will be hoping to lead us through a discussion of hope, hoping to do, see what I did there. Um, I'm going to uh, quote a few things, talk about a few things, but ultimately what I want to do is bring us back around to this, this practice that we call the spark of humanity practice. We'll get around to that in a little bit here. I'd like to kick us off before I read the um, the working understanding, the working definition of living mosaic uh, with a quote, because honestly, when I tried to think about hope, I am, by the way, the village Eeyore among my families. Uh, I, I tend to be someone who is pessimistic to a fault and uh, who struggles a little bit with finding the silver lining in events and um, looking for that which is worthy of hope. Um, when I told Martha that, she said, well, that means we picked the right week for you to uh, to be doing this because clearly I need to do this work and doing it in public uh, is probably going to be good for me. I hope it's good for you too. Anyway, that quote comes from a, a poem by Emily Dickinson, which I think many of you will have heard of before, have heard before or read that begins, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Um, the image being one of something very ephemeral, very light, lifting, uh, singing, and always speaks to the soul when we, when we dare to hope. The working definition of living mos of the living mosaic is that the image has emerged of a living mosaic, a, a mosaic as the solution to the current global crises, which I think we can all admit there are many of them. We, all sentient beings, are each bit of the mosaic, a tile, a piece of broken glass or mirror, a pebble, a shell, and probably more options that we're not seeing. Each bit of the mosaic is unique. Each one is essential to the mosaic. For our satisfaction, we need to become true to the bit that we truly are. We need to be willing to be, even if at times roughly, moved toward our unique place of effective engagement in the dance. Which place may develop and evolve? The mosaic is living, after all. So before I move on, those are not my words. And Martha would say they're not hers. They're words that have come to her. And I love that image. Um, and I love this idea that um, we've lived through some dark stuff in this, uh, in this lifetime. Most of us, unless we're, I don't know, two days old, we've uh, been, in, we've encountered things like airplanes flying into buildings wars that we wish we weren't engaged in. We've lived through loved ones dying or being ill. We've possibly been ill with from the pandemic. We've had major medical problems. Those things all speak to the extrinsic qualities um, of, of crises that we might find. There's the climate crisis. There's, the, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Um, but 
I think it's important for us to uh, to find a way to constructively engage uh, with with the darkness, to find a way to to enact change, to bring something positive into the darkness, to light a light, if you will. Um, the concept of a mosaic of which I am an important and essential part, yet which is a, a vast mosaic, a vast, a, a, you know, I don't want to overwork that word, but if you've seen great large collections of tiles arranged in a way that we can that we can see an image emerging and we can look at those individual pebbles, pieces of mirror, pieces of shell. Somehow that big pattern is much bigger than any one of us can conceive and much bigger than any one of us can create. We therefore need a, a way, a path toward finding our own spot in that vast pebbly array. Uh, of, of things that create a much larger image. As I said before, I'm, uh, I'm a friend of Martha's. Uh, we know each other from her being a solitary religious. I do know that she doesn't bring that into these discussions on Living Mosaic very often. Uh, so it won't beat that to death, but uh, we know each other from church. And although I'm broadcasting not from the studios of Orca Media, in fact, I'm on the other side of the country in my own place in Southern California, which, by the way, sounds like a better place than Vermont, but I'm dying to move back. I'm actually working on that already. There's a hope of mine. Um, but yes, I, uh, I, I am far away physically, but spiritually, I try to be present uh, with her and with this work and with this network, this spark of humanity network. So yes, we're going to talk about hope. Um, we're going to talk a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about myself, my own struggles with hope. Uh, uh, I might as well start off a little bit with that so that you know who you're getting here. Um, I have been through a lot in my life, in my overall life. I'm a trans woman who, because of my age, I grew up in a time when I was frequently vilified occasionally physically attacked, and I've lost jobs. I've gone through some pretty rough paths to get where I am today. Uh, and I have more recently gone through uh, devastating health problems, beginning with the pandemic, and uh, have had six heart attacks, no kidding, um, have lingering effects of having COVID more than once, uh, long problems. I, I've got a lot of things to complain about. I could sound hopeless for the entire amount of time that I'm trying to fill here. But I've been asking myself a lot, like, well, what has kept me alive? And it's, it's occasionally been friends and family to be, to be sure the love of people that have been there for me. But there's been a kind of more ephemeral idea of hope, uh, a more ephemeral construct that has been at times ridiculous, naive, childish. I've hoped that in spite of the fact that I can't work anymore, that I would somehow stumble upon a large amount of money. I'm not playing the lottery. I'm not doing anything to stumble on a large amount of money, but something has, has come back and it's, it's occasionally been ridiculous, um, childish. Uh, at its best though, hope has been childlike. Um, it has been that ephemeral uh, tale that Emily Dickinson spoke of, this uplifting of the spirit, this uplifting of the soul. Um, those moments have been, um, they've been more real. You know, the, the idea that money or a wonderful life partner that's going to fall out of the sky, because not only am I not able to work, I'm not you know dating or, or looking in any real way but the idea that those things are going to fall out of the sky are kind of extrinsic but this ephemeral thing this these this thing with feathers this thing floating 
lifting up um, I, 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 my ability to believe it's there and not only believe it, but to touch it uh, by letting go of the things that make me afraid or make me feel weak or vulnerable. Vulnerable, important word. We'll get back to that in a minute. Um, that is the hope that I live that is childlike. I, I hope it's childlike. Um, and I believe that that childlike quality is capable of, of touching this spiritual floaty stuff that we call hope. Um, we, we are sometimes, we sometimes benefit from taking a look at a word and looking at its opposite. And uh, by looking at its opposite, it might help us to see it a little more clearly. Um, in trying to do that, I, I came across, um, like, like there's a cheat code in this case. Hope as a noun is, is, is opposed by, is contradicting hopelessness. Easy, we're done. We don't need to talk about that. No. Um, there is the emotional response to hopelessness, which becomes despair, like a real sense that there is nothing that can be done to improve our circumstances or even to improve our feelings about our circumstances. We, we can fall into that. And despair is a darker place that seeks to oppose a much larger place of of fullness, of, of, of what we spoke about a minute ago, the, the, the foolish, childish belief that things can and will change and that we can be part of that change. We can be part of that change not by opposing that, not by, by digging into the negativity and being negative toward what we perceive as negative, being angry about the things that we perceive as angry. They started it. We re only responded. Uh, that kind of thinking, it, it leads into a place of self-resonant negativity. From that place, perhaps we can imagine a place of self-resonant positivity, hope. I'm going to try not to say that word too many times. I feel like I already have. But again, it's ephemeral. It's got feathers. It floats. It's very, very light. And um, yeah, so uh, I kind of have to use it to try to define it. Um, by the way, we usually see a number of pauses saying that if you want to contact us, there is usually a phone number on the screen. I'm not looking at Orca Media right now, so I'm looking at a Zoom session. So I don't know if that's the case. If you want to join the Zoom session, the email, which I presume you received earlier, will have a link in it. You can join this and you can ask questions. I would love to, uh, I would hope that someone would do that because I am in fact uh, sitting here flying by the seat of my pants. So a little bit of feedback and connection wouldn't hurt. But uh, I do understand that that may not happen. You may be watching this long after I sat in my little music studio and uh, and recorded this session with the help of Orca Media. So when we look at uh, when we look at a hope, it's important to think about how we use that word. I mean, we sometimes will say, well, I should hope so, or, uh, you know, which kind of leads to this weird negativity of, of speaking about the the least thing, the minimum, I I would expect it is maybe a better word. We don't we don't say that, but uh, we are saying I expect the bare minimum or better out of this situation, and it always carries a bit of derision, a bit of again negative. I always I like to talk with my friends about double negatives. Um, we we were taught as a kids as kids in school that double negatives don't convey negativity. They convey weirdly, roundaboutly, they convey positivity, um, <clears throat> but they're just self-contradicting. 
Um, in the case of, of these double negatives, uh, I I hate hatred. <laughs> this is, is a good example. Um, and, and that kind of thing, again, is that self-reinforcing negativity of which we are striving to escape, to rise above. Um, so uh, what, what do we think of as hope? I mean, when do we use the word? <clears throat> we, um, we've heard it used politically, I think to great effect at times that betrays my prejudices. I'm not gonna dive into those. My political beliefs and prejudices don't have a space here. This is not a political broadcast. Um, but the the idea of, of of wishing for change toward a more equal world, a world with greater equality, with greater justice, a world with um, with room for us all to thrive, isn't that naive? Isn't that child like bordering on childish? Depends on who's saying it. And whether I agree with them or not, how I'm going to judge that. But um, we always see hope as lifting us toward uh, an object, a condition, a status, a, another person of desire. We often conflate our notions of desire with notions of need. I like to remind myself that if I'm saying I, I desire, and I do a sip of water right now, I would have survived without that. Um, yeah, however, if I talk about water in general, clean, safe, uh, fresh water, um, if I talk about that in, in a broad sense, it is a human need. And that kind of, of paring down of the many times in our lives that we've wanted something and we've convinced ourselves we needed it and it was going to gratify us. Again, just trying to tease apart the idea of object or condition of desire and talk about hope as this, again, ephemeral, this light lifting thing that rises up toward that place of desire, of, of, of genuine, I'm going to say that again, genuine hope. I'm, I, I kind of do keep going around in circles. Um, I'm spending a lot of time and I'm going to run out of time if I don't do this. I want to talk briefly about the SPARK practice. Go to our website, sparkofhumanity.net, and, and spend a little time there. The, the uh, basic definition posted there is that we accept the insight that there is a spark of humanity in everyone, in each of us. Some question what the spark might be and want to define it or analyze it. And instead, we prefer to accept and affirm the validity of the insight, noting that it implies a possible connection with any other human being and the potential for greater light and warmth. To really understand this, by the way, uh, Martha does these live streams, and she also does a uh, phone conference session on every other Sunday. Uh, sign up for the for the newsletter, and you'll you'll get those uh, bits of information. Uh, again, sparkofhumanity.net. Um, I will not continue reading all of this. I will um, I will briefly talk instead about my own experiences. Um, I went through a period of, as I mentioned, great health problems, a long period of despair, a long period of not feeling. Yeah, I'm going to say it again, not feeling any hope, feeling really like life is over and I'm just watching the watching the salt fall out of the shaker or something. I'm just watching it run out before me. Um, when I started tuning back in to life, uh, I reconnected with Martha. I started watching these streams uh, and I started to uh, attend the phone sessions. And I began to understand this idea of a spark of humanity. For me, what immediately arises, and it, it's it's a risk saying this because it's my vision when I hear spark of humanity. Uh, and I, I don't want to tell you that, I don't want to imply that you need to share my vision. But I see a little fluffy 
light. It's always orange for me for some reason. It's kind of a dim light that's inside sometimes my heart, more often in my solar plexus. Um, and I have, I, I began to say to myself, well, what if I, what if I encouraged that particular vision? And what if I looked for that in other people? And I started to be able to do that with my friends. I didn't tell them I was doing that. I just would be sitting around sharing a laugh and I would try to picture that inside of them. And at one point, a couple of months ago, I decided that I'm going to take the risk of the next time I have any conflict, I'm going to try to do that with the person that I have conflict from. I have multiple of these stories, which is why they make sense for me to refer to in, in, in terms of hope, because I've done this a number of times and have seen changes, not in the other person, not in their attitude. I didn't fix anybody. I didn't fix myself. I found that stepping into a place of vulnerability and imagining someone else in a place of their vulnerability, that that changed the tone of the conversation. So one of those stories, I have a friend, I play cards with a small group of women uh, once a week. It's not gambling, it's just, a, it's, it's really a children's card game. It's one I had never heard of before. And uh, we get together and we play cards and we chat and we do that for a couple hours once a week. And there is a situation that I find very hopeful. I live in a retirement community now, and I found it very hopeful that they were that the community is looking to replace the gasoline-powered buses, the shuttle service that we have here, with electric buses, and so therefore reduce our environmental impact. I saw that as just a wonderful thing. I'm sitting with this woman, with these women, and this one lady who is she she believes in climate change she all of the things we share a lot of political perspectives she just started freaking out oh they're they're gonna you know those electric vehicles they they burst into flames they're gonna they're gonna kill us all uh they're gonna be a horrible horrible thing and it was so annoying and it went on every week that i began to consider not going to the card game anymore because it was affecting me and i was becoming angry um I found, however, that by touching that spark in me after several weeks of the same subject coming up and me trying to argue her through this, I found in a particular circumstance that I could back away from that conflict, that I suddenly saw that, that that uh, <laughs> chokes me up because I could see that spark in her and I could see it in me and it was it was much more tangible than the conflict that we were engaging in. Since then, I have been uh, blessed to be allowed to help her with some serious financial needs she has. I was able to help her get um, what we used to call food stamps, uh, a, a program to enable to give her money to help her buy groceries. I was able to help her do that, to hold her hand through using the debit card that the state of California gives you if you're on that program and encourage her. I've been able to help her a couple of other times. The gift to me is the ability to help someone else and to, God, I'm embarrassed right now, but to have that accepted and to have that ability to touch someone else's life. And that has moved me. And by the way, she hasn't budged on the electric vehicle thing and I haven't budged on my heels being dug in either but uh, but there is the um the the tale from from the front from from the day-to-day -day life thing of uh of engaging this practice in a state of conflict that was then transformed into something that had nothing to do with the conflict it it was me being vulnerable and her being vulnerable and that is the change that I'm going to say one last time. That is the change I hope for and that I hope for in your lives. Thank you for joining us. Um, look for you to be among the viewers in future broadcasts when I will once again safely be a viewer. Thank you very much. Goodbye.